Uh, you're good. All right. Welcome back to the Contacts Coaching Podcast. We are joined today by Coach Alex Pribble. University of Idaho, sitting in the brand new office, in the brand new center that they have built. Really cool to see this from here, even though I haven't been there yet. Coach, thanks for joining us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. That just means we got to get you up here. Yeah, it's uh, it's an honor to be on with you today, man. It really is. Well, I plan to come up there at some point to see you and my boy B. Laird. Um, all right, well, let's do this, Coach. Let's uh, help the audience understand uh basically how we got where you are let's talk through your background as a coach how did you get involved how did you get your first job what was the process like as you transition job to job what'd you learn what'd you take with you whatever you feel is relevant I love it man just shooting from the hip let's do it um well I tell you what I'm a northern California guy I've listened to a lot of your podcasts you've had so many great guests on it and a lot of NorCal coaches that I've uh that I'm connected to that I've learned a lot from that I've crossed paths with in my career um, so, you know, growing up in, in a town called Fairfax, right in Marin County, north of Golden Gate Bridge, and uh, grew up kind of in a basketball community. Uh, Drake High School, Sir Francis Drake High School is the, the school I went to, playing summer camps, a, a pirate camp, basketball camp, tons of coaches that came through there, guys like Steve Lavin and Paul Trevor and Dave Granucci and just a ton of uh, ton of coaching legends. It's a, it's a fantastic basketball community. So I grew up exposed to all that. Um, enjoyed my high school career, had a pretty solid high school career, and then ended up walking on at Cal Berkeley. Um, Cal was kind of the school that I always grew up admiring, watching. You know, I was a little ball boy at some of their games. So it was a huge honor for me to be able to, to make that team, play on that team for a couple of years, and end up earning a scholarship. Um, so played, contributed for a couple of years there, and then stuck around as a grad assistant. Kind of got my first look behind the curtain at what the, the coaching experience was all about, the coaching life was all about. Um, really enjoyed that and then ended up diving into the high school ranks for a little while. So I was a high school coach at Tamil Pius High School, was a teacher and coach, uh, was there with my brother, you know, in, the, in the, the county that I grew up in, loved every minute of that. But I was spending all my time doing practice plans um, instead of lesson plans. And so I decided, you know what, I better go full time as a coach. So um, dove head, head first into the, the college coaching business, got a great opportunity to work for a mentor of mine named Paul Trevor, who I know you've had on the pod before. Um, that doesn't get better than Paul Trevor. I mean, he is a bulldog. He has players run through a wall from him for, for you know, my first experience coaching college to uh, to work for a guy like him was unbelievable. So went from from uh, two great years with Paul Trevor to uh, the Division One ranks at Eastern Washington. That brought me up to the Pacific Northwest. Um, had two good years working for Jim Hayford at Eastern Washington. Second year, we won a, a Big Sky Championship. I went to the, to the NCAA tournament. A guy named Tyler Harvey, who played in the NBA, was kind of our star on that team. So great experience at the Division One level. And then got a chance to uh, take over my own program. Was at St. Martin's University for four years, uh, kind of helped build that up. They, they were in a bit of a tough spot, kind of a rebuild, and uh, kind of year by year got better and better and ended up going to the NCAA tournament a couple of years and going to the Sweet 16 my second year there, uh, which led to uh, an opportunity at Seattle U. And that was my most recent job, was there for four years and Worked with a guy named Chris Victor and, and a bunch of great coaches there. Um, a terrific experience. And long story short, was was blessed with an unbelievable opportunity to, to come here to the University of Idaho. Uh, Move my family out here. Uh, been here for about six months at the University of Idaho. Have a six-month-old son. And uh, things have been going crazy. You know, just flying a whirlwind the past past few few months, but enjoying every minute of it, man. So it, it's been a great stretch. Love that. And uh, Coach Trev, as you said, uh, wonderful human, great coach. Uh, and the irony, as we were talking about the NorCal connectivity of the basketball world, is Trev was at Sonoma State way back in the day when we first connected uh, with Rich and Fiscaldo and all the yeah. other CC2A legends. But uh, I would like to know, um, as you transitioned, from an assistant to a head coach for the first time. Mm. And you had obviously coached under some people that set you up for success. Mm -hmm. um, we we all feel like we're ready to take our bite at that apple. Um, but the reality is you're never ready. And so as part of the show, it's a, a database of mentorship for people. I always ask, like, what is it you realize right away you need to figure out, even though you thought you were ready? Um, yeah. And I would love to get at each stop because institutionally yeah. things are different. So what mm -hmm. can you offer there? 
Yeah, it's a great question. And it is, you know, they talk about those six inches, uh, you know, being a big change when you get that head coaching job. Um, you know, for me, I actually had the opportunity to coach three years out of high school. And truthfully, those years were um, were huge for me. I got to cut my teeth. Just you got to find your coaching voice. You got to start to get comfortable out there on the floor. Um, so just even though I was completely unpolished, just an emotional train wreck at the time, just, you know, <laughs> throwing everything I could into high school coaching. I was learning a ton during that time. So I had a little bit of experience from that standpoint. And then, you know, when I was with Paul Trevor, I've taken a lot away from everybody I've worked for. Um, first off, I think if, if there's one strength, that would be it. That I constantly have a coaching journal and I'm constantly taking notes and trying to learn lessons and get better over time. And so when I was, when I was writing in my coaching journal, working for Paul Trevor, at San Francisco state, I constantly made note of the way that he was able to build relationships with his players and be genuine as a head coach. And so, you know, for me, um, you know, I had that experience working for a guy who the players just absolutely loved. His players would run through a wall from, he was just, he, he was, he was coach Trev. He was the guys that, that everybody loved. Um, and I worked for him. And then I contrasted that with my second experience, which is at Eastern Washington, working for a guy named Jim Hayford, who was the ultimate CEO who understood every little piece of the program, how to run a program successfully, you know, how to build a fundraiser club, how to run camps properly, how to, you know, just, just every part of, of a program, um, you know, building a, a program blueprint, he had it all laid out in such tremendous detail. So I had a guy in Paul Trevor who was, um, you know, such an unbelievable leader, motivator, genuine, authentic guy that players just absolutely loved. And, and Jim Hayford, who complimented that and had his own way of, of leading but also had that kind of CEO hat. So I got to see both. And so when I got to uh, to be a head coach at St. Martin's University, I had my coaching journal. I had my blueprint, the way I wanted to do things. And I learned very quickly that I had to be myself. I couldn't be Paul Trevor. I couldn't be Jim Hayford. But I was able to take things from both of them and kind of mold it into a, into a uh, you know coaching style that, that has worked for me. Follow-up. I have my blueprint. I'm ready to go in. <laughs> I'm at St. Martin's and over the course of, uh, let's say your first year, I'm sure it all blends together, but let's give uh, a start and stop to it. And then I would love to know the same at Seattle and, and well, we're not quite there at Idaho yet, but what did you immediately realize you needed to throw out of that blueprint and what did you need to ad lib that wasn't in there at either of those stops? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the reality is I just couldn't be so, um, structured with it, right? I couldn't follow every single part of the blueprint to a T, you know, and for me, it, it was more about having a framework, right? I wanted to go in with the framework in mind and then I could make adjustments. So I, I was, you know, I knew that I would have to make adjustments, but I made adjustments to a lot of it, man. I mean, I had everything laid out in pretty good detail in terms of what plays we wanted to run. And obviously your plays, your X's and O's are going to adjust to your personnel. I knew what kind of players I wanted to recruit, but then I look at the scholarship allotment and things are going to change drastically based on what you have, you know, in terms of resources. So um, it was constantly changing and, and I was modifying my approach, but at least I did have a framework. I did have a blueprint in mind going into it. So I think across the board, I mean, from the strategy, from the X's and O's to the operations, to the fundraising, there were adjustments made to, to absolutely every part of, um, you know, the blueprint. I was learning as I went and I was modifying that coaching journal and just trying to get better day by day. So you've mentioned fundraising twice now, and this is not something that I think gets coached enough mm -hmm. as we are developing the next generation of coaches. Yeah. So I'm curious because you said Hayford as the CEO had this thing dialed. Mm -hmm. uh, what have you found that works at every stop? when it comes yeah. to fundraising? Because obviously there's different things like what I'm gonna do here versus what you're gonna do there is different. But what Absolutely. have you found that works at every stop that you can offer other coaches that are listening? Yeah, yeah, well, fundraising is tricky and fundraising is something I think I'm still working to get a lot better at everywhere I'm going. Um, so for me, um, fundraising, much like recruiting is about relationships. So you have to identify the people that want to support your program. And, you know, it might be different at some levels at the high school level, it was finding the friends and family and the community members that wanted to support. And here at Idaho, it's much more about the alums and the boosters and, and maybe the, the local business owners that, that want to support in that way. So you identify who the people are that have an investment in your program, and then you start to build those relationships. A big part of what I've been doing here at Idaho, honestly, is just relationship building with alumni, relationship building with 
the community members. Um, and I kind of think of it as like, like planting seeds. There's no, I'm not asking for money right now. I'm just kind of talking about our vision for the program, um, talking about, you know, basically proving to people that I understand a good men's basketball program at the uni University of Idaho can do a lot for this community, can do a lot for the people that care about Idaho athletics. So just kind of pouring myself into that. And then on the back end, once those relationships are built, I think you have people that are professionals, at least at this level, people in the advancement office, um, people in the fundraising office that can help me with the actual ask um, to, to get the resources. Now, a couple of things I'd say. One is I learned very quick that you have to produce results before you get the resources. It's not the other way around, right? It's not like the resources are just coming in as soon as you get a new job. Now I gotta, you gotta prove it first. Um, but once you do, and you have some, some results and you, you move the program in the right direction, then you need a framework in place. Um, whether it's a booster club that, that we've had a lot of success with, um, we call it the six man club. That's something directly from Jim Hayford at Eastern Washington that, you know, there's basically tiers for people to invest and, and, and donate, uh, at different levels and gives them a little bit of ownership of the program. And that's been great for us, but just need a structure in place. Once you have those relationships built and, and hopefully you can, um, have some people that are willing to help out. Yeah, and I think I would echo that uh, for those that are listening. The key thing I heard you say is I'm not asking for money right now. I'm just building relationships. And ultimately, right. uh, Chad Sanji said on this thing, I don't know, a year ago, which was relationships are like bank accounts. You got to make deposits before you can take a withdrawal. And so That's ultimately, great. like you don't, you're not trying to be transactional by any means, but mm -hmm go in there like with your hand out um like you're missing the boat on this thing like let yeah. tell people what you're doing let them involve yeah. like let them be behind the scenes and like where you're trying to go and you'd be surprised at the help that's out there for you both financial material and not material support yeah yeah no that's spot on man and i think when you talk about fundraising sometimes it could, you just start thinking about the the dollars and cents and it's that you, you make a great point man there's a lot of resources that people can provide different ways they can support your program that might not be monetary so you sit there with your hand out asking for you know a 50 dollar donation when in reality you could be building a relationship and that person could have a connection to somebody else that can come and speak to your program or that can you know donate something to your program or just just different ways that people can help impact your program or impact your young men that all has to do with fundraising and, and really at the end of the day has to do with relationship building. Yeah, no, I love that. And I think it's super important that people that are wading into this understand. I think you could probably echo this when you were young at TAM, probably keeping a super tight circle. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you went back there now and I was the same way at El Camino, it's like, not like, just let us do us and you guys stay over here versus like, you know what? I want everybody involved. Come to practice, come ask questions, come hang out. Like, because it's like your ego gets out of the way and you realize like, why would I be shutting people out? Absolutely, man. And that's kind of been our policy here at Idaho. You know, we want as many people in the building as possible right now. Um, you know, every football game, I'm out there at the tailgates talking to people, engaging every soccer game. We're out there supporting everything we can do um, to engage with the community right now. And have people take a look at our practices, have people take, a, you know, we're just trying to generate some excitement right now, have people involved. And, and that's a big part of what we're doing. Love it. All right, let's pivot. Uh, what would you say is the best thing you do in your program that has the largest ripple effect on your culture? Hmm. Culture is a buzzword. I don't want you to go down the rabbit hole there. But one of the things that I offer that we do um, that I actually stole from Brandon when he was at Menlo yeah. uh was that like we hug before practice after practice before games after games yeah. as a way to break down some barriers especially in our our male athletes where generally they're not taught to emote they're not taught to say i love you uh yeah. and so that's been a way that we've utilized that tool over the years at, in all of yeah. my stops um yeah. something like that what do y'all have that that you've brought with you that you will always do no matter what yeah, we've got a number of things. First off, I love I love that idea about hugging. We do that too. I think less uh, it's less of a formality, but basically before every practice, I just I get a touch with every guy. It's a hug. It's a you know whatever it might be, but it's a touch point with every single guy before every practice. I, I love that man. And, and yeah, you're so right. In our community, in our day and age, um, getting guys to let down their their barriers, let down their wall a little bit, emote, be, be, you know, love each other. It's it's so important. So all that is related to our culture. Um, 
couple of things that I think are specific for us. One is actually new this year um, and has been huge for us building a new culture with a new program. We call them NBTs, but they're non-basketball talks. It's every Wednesday and it's, it's on, it's exactly what it says. It's, it's a non bat We're not allowed to talk basketball during this hour, hour and a half, whatever. So we've done all sorts of stuff in our NBT. Some of them is just sharing about your family, sharing what's your favorite holiday, what's your favorite food, just get to know each other a little bit. Um, some of them is, you know, teaching the guys how to tie a tie or change a tire. Uh, we went down downtown for the Juneteenth holiday and just kind of celebrated with the local community, just different things unrelated to basketball, um, but all completely related to cohesion. You know, we want our guys to have, have uh, not just task cohesion on the court, but social cohesion where they're, they're getting close to each other. They know each other and, um, just forming strong bonds. So those MBTs have been huge. Um, another couple that are just a huge part of our program after every single practice, we identify one player as a coaching staff that we think had a good practice. Um, and we have them speak to the team and then we have them call out one of their teammates to actually get the break at the end of the day. So different, different ways to encourage kind of a player led program. We want them talking to each other, them engaging with each other. Um, it's just the way we wrap up practice every day, you know, the, those player led huddles. And then I think the last one that's related to kind of building our culture, that's been really good for us is something I took from Chris Victor at Seattle U that's was a huge part of our program there. We call them put ups, but at the end of every week, we circle up arms around, just like we do at the end of every practice. And we just open the floor. Who, who's got to put up? Who wants to recognize anybody else in our program? And sometimes they'll be recognizing the athletic trainer or our strength trainer or a teammate. You know, sometimes they're recognizing players who are hurt but are still battling through. Or sometimes a guy just, you know, needs a little pick me up and, and his teammates are able to genuinely, you know, they look each other in the eye. They can't just tell the group. They have to look each other in the eye and say, hey, I got to put up for so and so. And here's the reason why. And you're just talking to each other honestly. And, and that's been huge for us too. So, those NBTs are big for us. Those those player led breaks at the end of every practice are important for us. Um, and I think the put ups have been really big too. That's great. All three of those. Um, the idea of the put up, we call them celebrations, um, mm -hmm. in regards to how you continue to focus on things you're doing well when mm -hmm. the season can sometimes be choppy. Um, yeah. And and we've gotten to the point here where it's trickled out into our other sports now um and our post-practice or post-game talks are two minutes long total counting the celebrations because it's mm -hmm. like i'm not talking to them it's like i haven't watched the film like yo i walk in the locker room hey good job hey celebrations let's go and then it's like we're out um and i think the value of what you just offered uh especially in this day and age of uh, and building uh, cohesion, as you said, is super important. Let me, I'm curious now, uh, based on the way in which you were able to share those so specifically, uh, if I were to ask you when the last time you started practice playing five on five was, what would you say? Started practice? No. All the balls it, out right when you walk in. Ne never, but... Okay. But I, I don't mean to interrupt, but but it's funny because you're putting your finger right on something that we literally talked about today, which is, the, you know, the need to do that more often and the need to not have everything overly structured where it's the same routine over and over and over again. There's so much value in mixing it up and warm them up, maybe get a couple pregame shots and let's just get to it and, and learn from that. Man, that's, it, it's a great a great comment, you know, um, Chris Oliver, basketball immersion talks about that kind of thing all the time. And, um, we're trying to find our right flow because I do have a tendency to be overly structured at times. Um, and I, I think that kind of thing is, is really valuable, man. Well, I'm not asking to convince you to do that, but although I appreciate your playing with it, uh, Tyler Costin, a PGC guy, uh, came in and spent three days with our teams a couple of years ago and he just posed the question and he's like, when's the last time you did this? I said, never. And it's like, oh, we're going to start right now. Boom. And then what I was really getting at with you is what are some things that are similar that are out of the box and non-traditional that mm. you do? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, I like to think a, a lot of the, the off-court things that we do are a little bit non-traditional, a little bit outside the box. I think we value those bonds. We value our players' mental health. We do some things. We have a nutritionist on, on – uh, on staff, we do some things related to the players' well-being that I think are maybe a little non-traditional or at least a little maybe new school. 
that are really important for us. So having, having, you know, the positivity, you know, we, we talk about having passion in our program, which, which is positivity and enthusiasm that, that kind of, um, you know, that culture, if you're watching a practice, I think that's a little bit unique and, and you just don't see everywhere. That's, that's a strength of ours. Um, beyond that, I mean, we, we do a number of things, um, you know, off the court, but, but on the court, there's, there's not a ton, man. I, you know, you got, you got me a little, a little tripped up here. Cause there's not a ton that I would call non-traditional on the floor. Well, I'm not trying to trip you up. It's a seed. Do what you want with it later. Maybe that's a conversation moment for the staff. Yeah. I like the idea. Hey, I like the idea, man. And talking to another coach on this, it's like, let's think about it. Let's round table this a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, you know, for us, we're always looking for new ideas, new, new things to do. Um, and so, yeah, we got to keep mixing it up for sure. Keep it fresh. No doubt. And what I found is that what do the kids want? They want to play. So yeah. ultimately, if you're trying to, if you had a couple bad ones and you're trying to get a good one, like let them play and then go yeah. do whatever teaching you need to do. Yeah. He also, Tyler's take on it was also, um, if you don't start that way, regardless of what your practice plan is, you don't really know what you need to dial in that day because uh, they may have stunk in the previous practice or the game, but yeah. they might be dialed. And all of a sudden, well, I don't need to work on that. We just need to reemphasize X, Y, and Z. So like, I don't know if it's functional. It was just yeah. something different. Yeah. I do think mixing it up though, just mixing up the structure a little bit, you know, there's, there's so, uh, so many times that coaches will just have the same build, right? You do your pre-practice stuff and then you do your guard big breakdowns and then you do your short-sighted games. And now finally you're scrimmaging at the end of the day or whatever your routine might be. And there's value in mixing that up. I think there's value in, get the guys warm, get the guys loose, whatever your, your dynamic warm up is, you know, maybe get some shots to make sure they're, they're performing. Right. But then just, yeah, roll them out and let's, let's get our scrimmage in. And um, you know, from there you can identify, like you said, identify what we're struggling that day. Maybe you're not rebounding the ball well, and then you want to backtrack and get some rebound drills in or whatever it might be. Um, but there's definitely value in mixing it up like that. So what I really wanted to ask before I got sidetracked, uh, that was great. I love that exchange. Uh, but you mentioned I'm going to the football tailgates. I'm going to the soccer games. And those people that have listened to this know my soapbox is the youth sports industrial complex has ruined athletics and uh, thinking people have to specialize. And I'm real bullish on like, yo, go be a three sport athlete. Uh, what have you yeah. learned watching other teams, uh, other disciplines, if you have it in, um, in your mind, in, in your file cabinet here, that you've been able to see, borrow, let's call it, uh, mm -hmm. or apply directly mm -hmm. to your teaching, to your coaching, to your sport? Yeah, well, I've done a ton of it. Uh, I love sitting in on other teams' practices. Love it. Um, we have a unique situation here in at Idaho where the men's basketball, women's basketball, and football coaches programs have all turned over the head coaches in the last two years. So it's all brand new. And so our football coach, who was new as of last year, has completely turned a program around already in year two and they're they're an FCS program in their top five in the country and just completely flipped it. And so I've been a fly on the wall as much as possible watching the way they do things, trying to pick up what I can. And truth be told, those NBTs, those non-basketball talks, they have NFTs, they have non-football talks. That's something I picked up from them um, and kind of modified based on what I learned from them. So I'm picking up things all over the place um, from the other programs. I sit in on our women's soccer practice. Uh, you know, th that coach does a phenomenal job. And everywhere I've been, I've I've tried to watch and learn from the other staffs, the other programs. Here, it's beautiful because our women's program is practicing right now, right behind me. I can just stand up and look out my office and, and soak up some of the new drills or the different teaching that they're doing. So always trying to learn new things. Um, I think, first off, I, I completely agree with you that um, so much, especially in, in youth sports, so much can be learned from playing multiple sports. I was a three sport athlete growing up, really a four sport athlete. Um, it, I think there's tremendous carryover from one sport to another. So I like watching soccer and talking about the angles that, that, you know, are playing out in soccer and then playing out in basketball. I like watching football and how organized they are with their play calling. You can do the same thing with your out of timeouts in basketball. And there's just, there's a lot of carryover um, from sport to sport. And, and I just enjoy talking to other coaches and listen to podcasts and, and just kind of learn as much as I can. Absolutely. And I think that's why it's such my soapbox these days is we get tunnel vision as coaches and I don't, we need to widen the, the field of vision and understand that there's crossover. There's, there's a reason that before the age of specialization, 
right? The best athletes were always the ones that did everything because of the yeah. transferability, right? The, the best coaches were the ones that coached all the sports. Um, yeah. And whatever, right or wrong, it's where we are. And I just like to point out, especially to our listeners, you do not have to rely. If you're in the sticks in the middle of nowhere and you can't go see another basketball practice, like go watch your football team, right? Go watch your softball team. Um, you know, I coached four years of eight to 12 year old travel softball. And I learned more about teaching in those four years than in the previous, you know, 12 as a basketball coach. Um, yeah. And I, I just think there's a lot of knowledge to be gained. Um, you know, on a similar note with that coach, I think um, one of the places I've learned a ton from also is actually the classroom. And I think it's related. So for me, you know, I, my brother is a high school teacher. He's, he's committed his life to, to, to being a teacher and impacting lives that way. Um, and he and I talk about it all the time, how similar our jobs actually are. Um, you know, coaching is teaching. Teaching is coaching. It's a direct carryover and learning how to um, actually teach somebody, you know, or, or be on the floor with somebody and, and help them develop skills and learn lessons. It, it, it is it is so, um, it's such a difficult thing to do. And I think you, if you watch a good teacher and they're in the classroom and the way they're demanding attention and the way they're breaking things down by example, reteaching it, just all those skills that you have to have play out on the court as well. Um, so you can learn from a lot of coaches. You can learn from other teachers. There's just, there's a myriad of ways that, that you can continue to grow um, within the profession. No doubt. And I love that. And what I've said often as a department here is athletics are just a vehicle to teach leadership, followership, and how to be part of something bigger than yourself. Yeah. It's like basketball, water polo, football, whatever it happens to be like, okay. that's the end goal. And, yeah. um, you know, I think figuring out how to utilize the vehicle uh, to get where you're going, especially as we help develop young people to be the next generation of leaders. It's, I don't, always love that that gets lost in the weeds of trying to chase a win. Right. And I think that's so a true. wonderful analogy about your brother. Yeah. Um, it's you know, related to that. Sorry. I mean, to keep cutting you off. You know, oh, great. Points in my mind. It's, it's unbelievable. I, I think, you know, for us with the development of young men, we, we define leadership very clearly in our program. We're not one of those programs that necessarily has a ton of values on the walls and you walk in and all that kind of stuff. But leadership is one of the things that's very, very clear. Um, because we believe that we're growing leaders within the program. And the way we define it is very simple. It's the ability to make those around you better and more productive, period. Like if you can find a way to make the people around you better, you're you're a leader. And that we let them know that that's not just on the court, but it's in the community, it's with their families, it's with their friend group. You know, if you can find a way to make the people around you better and more productive, you're a leader. And our guys, um, I think basketball has been the vehicle for them to learn that, but but that is a, a lesson that I, I really hope will will you know they can carry with them their whole life. Yeah, absolutely. I think we all hope for that, <laughs> and uh, we won't know for 10, 15 years. So um, you meant well. You didn't mention this. I was uh, Leo Lopez, who's the athletic director at De La Salle, was a guest a long time ago. And when I asked him, hey, you know, what's the, the most important thing when you took over as a head coach? And he's like, staff and schedule, staff and schedule, staff and schedule. And since you're new coming into this at a new spot, not new in being a coach, how would you describe slash advise for people to go about filling out their staff? How did you go about that? What were the things you were looking for? Uh, and obviously coach holistically, it doesn't need to be in the weeds um, in a particular setting, but I don't, I think that's also something that isn't coached for the next yeah. generation. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good call. I would say staff and scheduling. And then, you know, at our level, throwing recruiting in the mix and, and there you go, man, there's the job. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot more to it, but those are three major pieces of the puzzle. And look, I'm, I'm still learning. I, I'm trying to figure it out day by day. I, I have a philosophy. I have a blueprint for all three of those areas, kind of like we talked about earlier. Um, but I try to watch how others do it and try to learn and try to get better because I know I'm a long way from doing it perfectly. But for me, um, building a staff was the first and most important thing I could do. And so when I got the job, that was a, the, the priority. Um, no question. Even before we started talking to players, the priority was building a team of coaches. Um, and I'm extremely excited about the group that, I've, that that we've put together here at Idaho. So 
for me, it, it's just like building a basketball team. You have to build a staff that is aligned, but has a diversity of experiences and that they complement each other. They can't all have the same strengths. Um, you have to be able to cover for each other. And so for me, you know, I, I was aware of some of my weaknesses the first time around at St. Martin's, and I tried to make sure I brought in guys that were going to address my weaknesses. So um, really simply, I, I think I can use my staff right now as an example. Um, I started with with Matt Jones. So Matt Jones is um, he, he was our graduate assistant at Seattle University, but he's one of these young gun, hard worker, can wear a ton of different hats, covers a lot of ground, um, can do a little bit of everything within the program. And so right away when I got the job, I said, OK, Matt Jones, he's a guy that I want to go to war with. I want to build this program with. Let's let's do it. So it was Matt and I. And Matt's a 26, 27 year old young coach who's phenomenal, but what's his weakness? Experience. He's young. So the next step was finding somebody that balanced that out. You know, guys make coaches making each other better. So we went and found Brandon Laird. And I know uh, I know that's a familiar name to, to those who are, are listening on the podcast and obviously to you, but it doesn't get better than Coach Laird, a guy that has been a head coach in this league, has been an associate head coach for years and years in this league. So you talk about a guy that um, would completely trust, that could be my right-hand man, that um, has the experience, who's a phenomenal basketball coach and person and can kind of balance out the youth of, of the rest of our staff. Well, now you're starting to build something. Um, and so when we have Matt Jones and Brandon Laird and myself thought about it, really looked closely and said, OK, we got a bunch of guys, but they're all just basketball driven. You know, a lot of guys are good mentors and coaches, but I think um, we can get some tunnel vision at times in the middle of the season, just worrying about basketball. So what do we need? We need a great mentor, a guy that has been through it, has some life experience, and so we went out and got David Dunham, who is our uh, the associate head coach at Western Washington. Not only a fantastic coach, but just the ultimate mentor, the ultimate human being. Somebody that you know, if I'm if I'm getting on a guy in practice, Coach Dunham will come behind and make sure he's putting their arm around him and supporting these young men. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is, building a coaching staff is like building a team. You have to have different guys that complement each other, that have different strengths, different weaknesses, and they're going to get better all together. Um, and we were fortunate enough to actually add a guy named Adam Ellis who was with me at St. Martin's, um, who's also a phenomenal coach that that really complements all the other coaches on staff very well. So um, that's the way we did it for right or wrong. That's that's the way I think about it. And that that's kind of my framework for building a coaching staff. What I want to point out for those that uh, maybe have gotten distracted there was I learned at St. Martin's what I wasn't good at. And I mm -hmm. started there. And I want to offer that to all of us that are listening, that there's a couple different approaches in life, right? Like, ah, you know, I'm not good at X. Let me go spend all my time trying to get good at X or the other approach, which is I'm not good at X. I'm going to go hire somebody to do X so I can do Y. Um, talk a little bit about your realization of where your blind spots are. Uh, maybe an anecdote or two of what made that clear to you. And right. why you took the approach of shoring it up in the way in which you did rather than trying to invest all your time into like uh, clearing that blind spot, so to speak. Yeah, well, at St. Martin's, I was a young first time head coach at the college level. And so when I was 29 years old, 30 years old in the first season, I approached that job um, with the idea that I didn't want our players to take advantage of my youth. So I, I was a little bit separate, meaning um, I, you know, I tried to be a good mentor and tried to be a good role model, but I was very aware of, of being the head coach, being the coach, making sure the guys um, knew that, um, you know, that, that there was an authority in the room. And, and that's, that's not the way I want to run it now. I've grown out of that. But as a first time head coach, that was a weakness of mine. And I was, you know, emotionally driven and passionate. And some, some of the things that made me good at the time also were my, my weaknesses. Um, and I recognized that and I got better at that as, as the, the um, four years at St. Martin's went on. But so when I took over here, you know, I took those lessons with me, you know, and I want to make sure that I'm, I'm diving deeper into the relationships with guys and making sure that um, just finding ways to, to address some of those things that I didn't do a great job addressing the first time around. And, the way that we run the program here, man, I call it roundtable, but every single day we have a roundtable meeting. It's not a, you do this, you do that. It's we sit around together, have a discussion about every aspect of our program. Um, and so I need guys that coaches that, that, you know, it's not, it, it's vertical, it's horizontal leadership, right? We're all impacting each other. We're all helping each other out. We're all trying to find a solution together, not just um, a bunch of guys that are yes, men that are doing it the way I want it to be done. I want us to all come up with the right solution together. And so um, you know, built a coaching staff of guys that that have different experiences, different ideas, and and we can all complement each other. 
You know, I love that. And it takes me to a follow-up, which is, can you point to a few tangible, let's call them discoveries, um, yeah. from when you went from head coach back to assistant, mm -hmm. full circle back to head coach? Like, what did you learn sliding out of that head coach chair back to uh, becoming a recommending body again? Yeah, yeah, I think... You know, there's a couple of things that come to mind. One is I was obviously able to put myself in the shoes of uh, Jim Hayford and Chris Victor better than I was previously, meaning if they were going through something, I kind of knew when to bring things to their table and when not to. Maybe I could keep things off their plate a little bit more than than I did the first time around. Um, but there was also a different kind of confidence. I, I think that was a big piece of it. And, and the reality is if I, if I believed wholeheartedly in something and I could show it on film and I had, you know, examples to back up what I'm saying, I felt completely confident bringing it to them and saying, Hey, look, this is the way I think we should, we should do this. What do you think? Um, and I think I was better at that the, the second time around, you know, when I was for a, a first uh, time assistant coach for Paul Trevor, um, at San Francisco state, or even Jim Hayford at, at Eastern Washington, I was much more of an observer, I think. I'm trying to learn, trying to take notes, trying to trying to understand. And the second time around, I knew I could impact things at a different level. Um, and so I, I was confident in that. And if I was going to bring something to their plate, I was going to back it up with film and black, back it up with analytics and tell them, you know, why I believed in it. And I think that would make it easier for them to to move forward with, with one of my ideas. So I think that was one of the big things that changed. Thank you. Another follow-up question. Rich and I have talked about this a couple of times on Share with us? Yeah, on the pod and on uh, just regular phone calls we have. But yeah. what percentage of your time as the head coach of a program would you say you actually get to do basketball versus um, all the stuff that comes with it? And so I've joked, Rich and I have kind of figured out it's like, yeah, about 15% of your time is spent on basketball. The rest is spent on everything else. It's it's funny, man. It's it's a it's something I've thought about a good amount. First off, Rich Hayes, man, is is one of those guys talking about people, guests that have been on your podcast that I absolutely I've been following him since forever. When I was at San Francisco State and I was I was competing against their teams at Sonoma State, gosh, they they were awesome. Um, so I'd love to hear his answer to it. For me, uh, a, a couple things. I think if I'm doing my job correctly, meaning I'm organized and efficient um, with all the operations then it allows me to have more time as a basketball coach. And that's really my goal. I mean, I wouldn't, I don't think it's 15%. I think, you know, we try to do as much as we can on the front end operationally to be able to invest as, as much as we can watching film and being on the court. So that's my goal. And I have some great guys around me that can help take some of the travel and some of the logistics off. But you talk about fundraising, you talk about scheduling, you talk about some of those things in those buckets. It, it is very time consuming. So I don't have a good percentage for you. I wish I could say, ah, it's 50, 50 or whatever it might be, but I like to think about it as if I'm doing a great job organizationally, it's freeing me up to watch film more. It's freeing me up to get on the court and practice plan more and just focus on the basketball. And that's, that's really my goal. And really, if you think about the year as a whole, we're trying to do as much of the operational stuff up through uh, at our level, September 25th as possible. So that day one of official practice, we can really focus on basketball and not have to worry about any of the other logistics quite as much. Yeah. And, uh, I would say for the listeners, uh, it's definitely not 50-50. Uh, the <laughs> higher you go on the social right. ladder, the less right. you actually get to do the thing you want to do. Um, and uh, yeah, there's ways I think what you said is awesome because there are definitely ways that you can organize yourself in a way that allows you to have more time to do what you want to do. The reality of it is you're getting called in as the program lead to deal with things that ultimately at the university level are taking more precedence than, hey, we're trying to win a game over here. <laughs> it's yeah. like same with me as, as the AD. It's like, I can't tell you what I do on any given day, but I know I'm getting pulled into a lot of stuff that has nothing to do with uh, trying to win a basketball game. Um, <laughs> so uh, let's go here. You've talked a lot about kind of how your approach has shifted over the years, but I, I'm curious to know, as a guy that's always trying to get better, this is a growth mindset question that I stole from Rich Stahoviak, which is what have you most recently changed your mind on? And 
you could take it as a basketball thing if you want uh, or not, or it could be a personal life deal, uh, anything you want to use to answer it. But, but in, in truth, it's, Hey, I used to be real dug in over here Mm -hmm. for good reason. I had the why, this is what we do. This is how I navigate the world. And Mm -hmm. now uh, I'm over here and here's why, but it was an, it was an intentional shift in approach based on data or whatever it was where it wasn't just like, well, this is what we've always done. Yeah. Well, a couple of things come to mind. One is actually related to our conversation earlier, um, which is we play, just take it from a basketball standpoint first, we play just live five on five scrimmage way more than I used to as a high school coach or early in my career as a college coach. We're playing five on five every day in different versions of short, short uh, games, four minute games, two minute situational games, a full minute, 20 half, or full 20 minute half. We play a lot and then we try to backtrack and learn through playing. Um, so I think structurally, that's one of the biggest changes that, I, that I've gone through. Now, we're also we're not grinding, guys. We rarely go over two hours. Uh, we follow with a lot of skill work. But yeah, if we go for an hour and a half, hour 45, a solid chunk of that is is scrimmaging, is five on five scrimmaging. We might have different emphasis within that scrimmage, working on defending certain concepts or working on running certain actions, but we're out there playing five on five. So that's something that has completely changed. If you would have watched when I practiced as a high school coach compared to now, it would look completely different from that standpoint. Um, you know, beyond that, maybe a little more big picture is I kind of come back to, to the to the growth, the change I've made as a coach. When I was a younger coach, I just was much more basketball heavy. Like basketball was the that was the game I was teaching. Everything was revolved around basketball. And now as a I think as a new father um, and just having been through this a little more. I think I've, I've invested more in the one-on-one meetings. I've invested more in um, spending time getting to know the ins and outs of our players, the motivations of our players, um, you know, talking about mental health with our players. Just we're spending a lot more time on that. And it's not that I was obviously like anti that or against that earlier in my career, but it's just been much more of a focus. Um, and I believe it has a much larger impact on performance than maybe I, I did earlier in my career. Yeah. And I'm sure you've seen a tremendous benefit out of that, right? And that's kind of, if you listen to Oliver and these other guys, that's kind of the wave of teach from the the game, right? Mm-hmm. Rather than drill work. And I think uh, to the point where another thing that Tyler said while he was here is he refuses to call things drills, their activities. Uh, and, and ultimately, because drill work doesn't always translate. So how do you make sure that you're, you're learning in that way um, to best serve the, the student athlete, right? Um, All right, let me go here. And then I got to remind myself of what you just said that I want to follow up with. Um, What's a piece of advice that you have received over the years that has been most leaned upon, regardless of what you're doing, right? We get these uh, sticky messages that maybe we offer to kids or that we use in our family and other yeah. things like that. It's just like, you know what? These are the things that I always lean on. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it's funny because it comes back to the first piece of advice I was probably ever given, but but it's the more I coach, the more I just go on with life, I always come back to, to a quote from my dad, truthfully. And that was just before I took the field, before I took the court, every single uh, time I was going to play, he just turned to me and said, hey, have some fun out there. And it was so simple. And I just, it was, I thought it was just maybe some basic encouragement, but it's something that um, I'm learning more and more. Our young men play, the, the guys I'm coaching, they have to enjoy what they're doing. Their, their performance is going to change drastically if they're enjoying, you know, it, it can be a grind. They can work through it, but if they, if they're enjoying that process, they're going to get so much more out of it. They're going to get better in the long run. So finding a way to have joy um, within a program. It's one of our core values, but, but having joy, having fun out there every time they take the court doesn't mean goofy, you know, fun is, is working hard. Fun is doing something together as a group, but finding ways to have fun, um, you know, and starting with, with that lesson from my dad at an early age, is something I carried all the way with me. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think that is something that unfortunately organized sports have taken away from kids to a certain degree these days i mean and not intentionally right it's all with the best intentions of trying to help kids get better and do x y and z and it's like you get away from the time when you just play and like i've got a kid right now that's a freshman at villanova playing baseball and he would be and he was also the the 
county athlete of the year, football, base, basketball, baseball. And it's like, he would be in the gym playing pickup hoops in the middle of baseball season. I'm like, dude, no, like this is your main deal. You're not getting, he's like, dude, climb up. I'm not, I'm going to play. This is what I do. And it's just like, how much have we gone away from that mentality? Whatever. Yeah. Hey, hey, look, when I, when I was younger, there was a, there was a pickup basketball at Drake high school. And if, for those that are familiar with, with that area, it was the best hoops around in the summer. You had a great summer camp called pirate camp. There was a summer league, so the San Francisco program wasn't certified back in the day. And so all the NBA players would come. You have Kevin Johnson and Jason Kidd, these guys playing at Drake High School Summer League. And then throughout the year, and you know, weekends, weekdays, starting about four o'clock, there would be pickup basketball. There's four courts on the, uh, that, that were out there at Drake High School. Um, it's now called Archie Williams High School. But um, and, and the courts would be packed every afternoon, every weekend, and from about I don't know, 12 years old, I'd ride my bike down to the outdoor courts and I'd play pickup, just try to get on a game at the end. And then maybe by the time I was 14 or 15, they would let me in a little more and just hoop it just out there on the court. You, you, you're with four different guys every time. And, you know, there's some guys that are bullies out there. There's other guys that shoot every shot. There's other guys that don't defend, you know, and if you lose, you're off and just learning how to battle and compete in those kind of environments. I learned so much more from that than I ever would have in, you know, in a skills training session. Now, I, there, there's a need, there's a value for skills trainers. Don't get me wrong. I think there's some phenomenal skills trainers out there, but especially at a young age, if you can find an environment where you're playing against other people, preferably strangers, you know, in, in, that's good basketball still, um, you know, preferably play people that are older than you, a little better than you, and you got to find a way to compete against them. To me, that is fun and it's how you get better. Yeah, no doubt. All right. I remember what you said. Uh, fatherhood. <laughs> How would you say in the early six months of that experience, your approach to coaching has changed based on now having your own progeny to caretake? You know, what's funny is I, if this wasn't, I didn't think about this on the front end of hiring a staff, but I'm six months into this fatherhood deal. <laughs> And I'm trying to figure it out day by day. Um, and it's ex obviously extremely important to me. But one of the best things I did is I'm now doing life with with a couple guys, Brandon Laird, Adam Ellis, David Dunham, three of my assistant coaches who are unbelievable fathers. Uh, Brandon has a little three and a half year old and I get to watch the way he interacts with his son every day. That's been unbelievable for me. Adam Ellis, one of my assistants, has a young son and a young daughter. You know, I think it's four and two or something like that. And watching him be a father to those two young, it's been unbelievable for me. And, and David Dunham's got a great family and, and he's a phenomenal father as well. And so I'm just, just like anything else, man, it's like coaching. I'm learning. I've watched those guys interact and I watch what they say and, and how, how they, you know, generally care about teaching and, and, and helping their children. Um, and I, I'm learning, I'm just trying to learn every day. So it's been great. My son, Braden is six months old. He's a tank. He's a big, big six year old, or excuse me, six month old. And I love every single day coming home to them. Um, and so there's a lot of, it's just been an enjoyable six months, but I do think it's, it's allowed me to be a little more empathetic with our players. I do think it's allowed me to uh, maybe put myself in the shoes of their parents a little bit, you know, and, and just kind of think about um, not that I was, not that I was ever disrespectful. I'm, I'm loud and passionate and energetic, but I, I do think there's a time when I've been, I've been able to follow up with our guys a little more, where maybe in previous years, I wouldn't have taken the extra time to wrap back around with guys and check in with them. And, and uh, you know, I think it's made me a little more empathetic and, and want to build those relationships a little more. So uh, it's, it's new for me. I'm learning, um, but I do think it's had a positive impact. Thank you for sharing that. I think, uh, one of the things that is transformational for most of us that have children is the immediate awareness of how you now approach other people's kids and the excuses that you may or may not have wanted to make versus like, yo, man, is this how I want my child to be coached? And all of a sudden there's a, there's a pivot, whether it was intentional or not. And I think also the the example of how those around you are parenting and you getting to watch that. And it's like, I see Brandon parent from afar and it's like, he's way better dad than I ever was. But at the end of the day, it's like uh good job surrounding yourself with unintentional role models. Um, all right. Last, <laughs> last question. Uh, this is super random, but I'm thinking about it today. Uh, what is, 
a small act of kindness, random or not, that someone contributed to your success that you will never forget? A small act of kindness that somebody contributed to my success. Gosh, there's been a lot of them, man. Um, you know, I think for me, it's really about when I was younger. Um, and the name that keeps coming up in my mind, I think is Paul Trevor. And he's been a guest on a lot. Um, you know, Trev, Trev was my, so when I, I talk about pirate camp, summer camp a little bit, Paul Trevor was actually one of my summer camp coaches. So when I was in fourth grade, fifth grade, I have these memories, legitimate memories of Paul Trevor, you know, diving on the floor for loose balls at a summer camp, you know, or coaching me and, and really like coaching me in ten, with, with an intensity when I was in fifth grade. And um, the lessons I, I learned from that stick with me to this day. Um, you know, and I think he was just a guy that that really, when I was a coach and, and he gave me my first crack, um, you know, and the first time that that he kind of told me what the profession was about, we, he told me to hop in his car. We drove from San Francisco State down to Southern California for a recruiting event. And he just took about eight hours on that car ride, just got stuck in some traffic, just talking to me about the profession, talking to me about what life would be like if I decided to go down this road and just the idea of of uh, having somebody in my corner that that really cared about me when I first got into the business, I think, was a big deal. So uh, it's not a good answer to your you know small investment, but it is an example of a guy that um, went out of his way to invest in me when he didn't have to at a young age, and, and it stuck with me all the way through. It's actually a great answer because the follow up question then becomes, and you don't have to answer this, is when's the last time you told him that? Uh, and for everybody else that's listening, when you think about that question and you have one, reach out, tell the person how important they were to you, show some gratitude. It uh, goes a long way to get those messages randomly uh, when you don't. Gosh, it. Yeah, it, it's unbelievable because you're, you're uh, I'm I'm taking I'm going to be taking some stuff away from this podcast more than I'm sure I'm <laughs> be taking more than anybody listening to me. But I tell you what, that it's it's important and it's something that I'm not good enough at. Um, you know, I've gotten my routine together where I'm really happy with kind of the day to day. I get in the office early. I do a little gratitude journal. I have a little routine that I go through to get myself focused for the day and just self-development stuff that's, you know, put me in a good position to be able to be a good coach. But a place that I absolutely lack right now that is an, it's an emphasis for me moving forward is just that it's reaching back out to people that are maybe outside of my current tunnel vision. And, and making time. Um, you know, I follow Buzz Williams a lot, who's mm -hmm. obviously a fantastic basketball coach. And he does this thing where he gets in the office and every day he, I think he does like three touches, but I'll write two letters and then have three, you know, phone calls or text messages to people. So he's just constantly reaching out um, to, to other folks outside of his, his, his circle. And, and that's something I want to get better at. You know, I want to reach out to a Paul Trevor. I want to reach out to a Doug Donnellan, who was my high school coach. I want to reach out to you know, different people that I've either coached. Um, I actually did send a text to one of my former players today, just telling him I was thinking about him and he said it made his day and those kinds of things just, you know, they're, they're important. Um, and, and something that I don't do a good enough job at, but I want to in the, in the future. Well, and I don't think any of us do. It's one of those things where I was thinking on the early part of this conversation as you were talking about some things, it's like, man, we've got a group chat from two years ago from last year with our team. And it's like, I need to just send a note in there that just tells the guys I love them, appreciate them. I hope they're well. And it's ultimately, how are you spending some of that downtime in, in a way in which to do that? Um, I'm going to ask one more question just because it'll be funny. Uh, and I want to look for something else in regards to thank you while you're answering the question. Um, as a, as a NorCal native, who has now been in the Pacific Northwest and is now in Idaho. Uh, how big a part of your vocabulary at this time is the word hella? <laughs> it's funny, man. Now that I've been in the Pacific Northwest for 10 years, I do see things changing. Uh, you know, hella, I'll say it every so often. Maybe it's just more about growing up than it is about moving out of the area. I don't use hella quite as much, um, but there's so many things that I have noticed changing. Um, including the weather, you know, I went from a Nor NorCal guy. We were talking about this a little bit before, before the, the app started. And I went from a guy who just loved the sun and was out on the beach and could soak up the sun rays with the best of them to a guy who honestly, honestly craved the cloudy days. Now being in, 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 uh, you know, Seattle for four years and being out in the Pacific Northwest, I love a cool overcast day. It just makes me feel right at home now. So there's, <laughs> there's a lot of changes that have, that have happened since moving out here. All right. I thought you'd get a kick out of that. I can't find the notes I was looking for, but basically what I learned at PGC at one point was there's levels of thank you, right? And, uh, you know, level one, hey, thanks. You know, level two, hey, thank you for 
picking up the lunch from the store. Level three, right? You, there's this, this scaffold to where level 10, handwritten letter, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like, how often do we do that these days? I'll leave that for people who are listening to, to kind of ask themselves because I think any time, and I try to teach this to my children, um, they got to spend a summer working for one of my former students. And um, it, it was like, anytime you have an an experience that goes beyond the the norm, mm-hmm. right? Hey, write them a handwritten note when you get home, tell them how much you appreciated it. And uh, if nothing else, you let them know that their investment in you mattered, right? And I think that's something that uh, I try to leave them with. That's huge, man. If you find that, I would love to see it. Send it my way, man, because I'd love to to hear, you know, kind of an organized way to do that, um, you know, to give it some genuine thank you, some different ideas. We, you're, you're spot on about kind of the handwritten notes. It is something that I try to do and I'll do it with family members sometimes just send a handwritten note to my niece and nephew and things like that. And um, that that's a big deal. You know, we've also, I've had a, a former player who, um, you know, was struggling a little bit and, and took the time to kind of write him a letter recently. And that was therapeutic for myself as well as I think hopefully beneficial for him. And, and you take the time to actually write a note, write a letter, um, it goes a long way. You know, I don't think as many people are just making phone calls these days where you just call somebody up and, and just have a conversation, but there's other ways to um, just to get, get the point across to, 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 you know, tell them you're thinking about them, tell them you love them, tell them you care about them. And that stuff's very important, man. And again, something that I, I need to do a lot more than I do. Well, I appreciate that. And I found it while we're talking. So sure. I will share this with everybody. So it was actually called levels of appreciation Mm. and actually there's a good note i'm just gonna have a longer than normal um monologue here so the way in which it was framed was ways to stand out right as a player as a human being Mm. show gratitude we often don't realize what people are doing for us until they stop doing it like the referees, like what if they didn't show up? <laughs> How often are you thanking them for being there, right? And often because we're too focused on ourselves. So be other centric, right? Be a man or a woman for others. Um, and then it got into levels of appreciation. So level zero, no appreciation. <laughs> level one, you say thanks. Level two, it's a specific with your thanks. Thank you for blank. Level three, use a two sentence thank you. Thank you for bringing the beverages. I appreciate the way in which you took care of that aspect. Uh, And then from there, it skips to 10. Write thank you notes. The power of written words and notes is unbelievable, especially mail, right? In our, like, we grew up in an area where there was, like, email was just coming around. And now, when's the last time, like, you sent or received a written letter? Like, never. So that... You want to stand out, like take it to that level. Yeah, yeah, it, it's so true, man. And I, and I do think the the handwritten letters you're spot on is a, is a huge, you know, it's just a great way to genuinely thank somebody. Um, but I think the the word you started out with about gratitude, you know, showing gratitude is just it's an easy one, but it's so important. It's actually been a main main change. You know, I just lean right over here to the side of my desk and this. Honestly, like this is my gratitude journal. And every single morning I write the date down there. It says what I'm grateful for today. And it's just been a great way to kind of frame, um, you know, just how 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 much, how much fantastic of an opportunity is to be here. How grateful I need to be to be sitting in this chair right now. Um, you know, and, and some of the simple things you talked about, just having, you know, uh, uh, so, uh, some food to eat, some clean water to drink, some some people around you that are good role models, whatever it might be, whatever you might be grateful for that day. It's a great way to frame the day to start the day off. And, and it's what I do. Um, and, and that's been great for me. So I do think showing gratitude, feeling gratitude, it can have a big impact in your life. Absolutely. And I think it's a great place to end. In the meantime, coach, people want to follow your squad or you and any yeah. wisdom drops out there in the universe. Where can they find you? Yeah, I think uh, we've been trying to push social media pretty hard up here. I'm at Coach Pribble on my social medias, um, you know, and we're, we're Idaho, we're, we're um, Idaho basketball. And so, yeah, hop on, on social media and, and take a look, follow what we're doing. We've got a great, great group of young men. Like, honestly, it's that we're young, just one senior, but we're building something from the ground floor up and we've got a great group of young men. So I, I do hope people follow along this year and and watch what, uh, what hopefully the, the Idaho Vandals will be able to do over the next couple of seasons.
Awesome. Well, thanks for being on. Appreciate you. I'm going to let you get back to it and uh, look forward to seeing you when you ever get down here to God's country or uh, I leave Pebble Beach at any point to travel, which isn't very often. Let's do it, man. Come on up here and hang out with Coach Laird and I.